very quickly, uh, you'll be able to see this control panel on the right hand side of your screen. We can, uh, you can hear us, but we can't see you. Use that red to, uh, button to collapse the control panel and that'll let you see the, uh, see the entire screen. Please type any questions that you may have in the box provided there. We'll do our best to answer all of them at the end of the webinar. My recommendation is to put as much, uh, uh, type the questions clearly and concisely, but don't omit any detail um, that may help our presenters uh, answer the question for you, uh, the questions for you at the end of the webinar. Tonight's presenter is Dr. Paul Nylon, uh, and Paul is the owner operator of his own business, Nylon Farm Health in Tasmania. Paul is a, a very experienced large animal and especially sheep vet and has been practicing uh, been practicing in this space for a long time. We're very lucky to have Paul on board with us tonight and he is probably one of the best uh, resource people to, to talk on this subject of new health issues at and around the lambing point of lambing. And uh, we are looking forward to hearing from Paul uh, during the presentation. Also joining us this evening at the end of the webinar as a guest panellist is Dr. Bruce Watt of the local land services of working out of Bathurst uh, on the central tablelands. Uh, we're very lucky to also to have Bruce contributing to the webinar tonight and he is uh, as equally experienced as Paul and a very, uh, a very well regarded sheep vet. So between the two, these two men, we have um, as much knowledge and and no, uh, wherewithal as we could hope to answer these questions and to deliver this sorts of information. Um, Paul, I'll make you the, uh, the presenter there. Um, Paul, are you with us this evening? Yes, we, we are we uh, where we need to be? Sure, sure are, Paul. And I'm just showing the the results of that poll I took there. And um, I'll just show that for a couple of seconds and then we'll push on to your presentation. Cool. I couldn't actually see the results of the poll, David. What did you have? No, that's because you're you're showing your screen. So, 45% um, of the audience considers pregtox as the most important disease affecting their lambing ewes. 22% worm, 17% prolapse, 10% hypocalcemia, and 5% mastitis. There we go. There we go. Shall we take it away? Yes, for sure. We uh, will we'll see your screen. We can see your screen now. Thanks, Paul. Good. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all well and getting lots of rain. Um, now, before we kick off, just a, a couple of things. Firstly, we are indeed very privileged to have Bruce Watt with us. He is the uh, senior sheep veterinarian in Australia now, not because of his age, but just because of his extraordinary uh, a clinical and production knowledge bring away in Bathurst and also because in fact um, he can present a different point of view to what we see uh, in our irrigated type uh, lamb systems here in TAS. The second and probably most more important thing is that I'm running out of really good jokes so if anybody's got a good joke and they can type it into the question uh, part and you'll get the seminar for free. Okay so tonight we want to talk about uh, uh, some of the issues that we see with prime lamb enterprise and to all intents and purposes we'll limit our uh, discussion to enterprises that are using uh, specialist maternal genetics so not on the back of merino ewes and the reason for that is that the maternal genetics in fact accumulate most of the problems that we're going to talk about. Um, just bear in mind of course that uh, enterprise mixes and enterprise geography vary hugely over Australia. So I've got a bias towards uh, high rainfall and uh, irrigated production systems integrated with, uh, with uh, cropping. Uh, other parts of the country may vary quite a lot. Okay, so we're going to talk just very briefly about worms. 
Uh, then we'll move on to metabolic diseases, hypercalcemia and pregnancy toxemia, which will take up the majority uh, of the night. Um, and we'll try and disavow you of the notion that hypercalcemia is unimportant. We're going to talk about prolapses, just mention vaginal evisceration, and uh, then uh, again, very briefly, mastitis. Um, and I apologize if I'm talking quickly, but I think that's the only way we're going to get through it. Okay, so the opening um, salvo will be that um, we tend to run, I think, our prime lamb use at too high a body condition score. Um, so I think that the information that has come out of lifetime new management for merinos is absolutely brilliant for merinos, but if we copy it across to prime lambs, then we're going to have a whole host of issues. So in fact, uh, I think that if we just bear in mind that a good target range to be lambing down at particularly adult use as opposed to maidens is somewhere in the region of uh, two and three quarters to three and a quarter. There's a whole host of issues that start to accumulate if they get heavier in that and they're, they're listed there. Uh, but most importantly at all is that if you use a consistently heavier than uh, condition score three and a half, it probably means that you're understocked uh, and that's going to be a key profit driver. Now, I know that last week um, that uh, B. Kirk uh, from the McKinnon Project did um, a, uh, a very good talk on worms, uh, but I believe that it also generated a deal of controversy. So I just want to run through very quickly the sort of advice that I might give people whose enterprise that I, I wasn't particularly familiar with. Um, and I'd also predicate these remarks by saying that in general, well-nourished uh, crossbred ewes or, or maternal genetics with adequate tucker in front of them are extremely robust. Now, Australia-wide, I'm sure that the pre-lamb drench is probably the most routine drench that we have, even more so than the, uh, than the strategic drenches in areas that use them. However, just as a sort of a throwaway line, which we can discuss in, in um, the, the question time, um, I think that we can approach it in three three ways. And the first thing is to consider not drenching. And I would consider not drenching in these circumstances. If the ewes are condition score three or better and have adequate pasture going forward, there's no evidence of gross contamination. Now, you can use the ewes' own egg counts, but that's sort of a bit dicky. But uh, if you've had deaths on those pastures, particularly from weaners, um, or you've got serial egg counts which suggest that the worms uh, are starting to accumulate then you don't uh, you don't do it but if you've got that same evidence that show that there's no accumulation of worms then it might be fairly safe and of course in that situation the fallback position is going to be uh, a drench at landmarking so here in Tasmania we have a fairly hardcore body of people who don't routinely drench their uh, prime lamb use at all uh, and then we have a sort of a smaller core that make that decision on a year by year basis. Now we seem to have lost the go forward. What's happened? Here we go. Um, for most people, they're going to be drenching with a short acting and with, without information on, on uh, resistance, we'd say a multi-active, so a, a, um, an abomectin triple or something similar. Um, and that's certainly going to be the case if, in fact, you've got um, uh, lambs on if you've got uh, lambs on um, I'm sorry, if you've got ewes that are struggling a bit or feed is marginal or if you've got information that suggests that the paddocks might be contaminated. Sorry about that little stutter there. We are trying to move our clients away from reliance on prolonged action actives. Not because they're bad, in fact, they're absolutely brilliant. But in fact, if we use them uh, inexorably and uh, without relent, um, they will accelerate resistance. And so places in Tasmania that have the worst resistance are those that have used um, an LA of one form or another, whether it be the injectable or a capsule for the last 20 years. So, um, the situations where you would consider it is, is if there's evidence of gross contamination, so parasitic deaths before lambing on those paddocks. 
Um, if the ewes are really struggling, so drought situations, um, and if you have a prodigiously wet year. Now, my concern with prodigiously wet years, in fact, is that uh, in the high rainfall zones, uh, particularly in Southern Victoria and Tasmania and Southeast South Australia, those years are really good predictors of situations where uh, you're going to fall in a heap with uh, black scour worm. So, um, you know, really a combination of all of those three, but uh, just bear in mind that the wet years can be a little bit of a rude surprise. Okay, so in what situations would you always drench? Well, um, if it's a strategic drench, and the situation there, in fact, is the pre-lambing drench for, for um, the New England. And if you've got a new sowing or a prepared paddock that you know is going to be uh, really low worm status, uh, and those situations, it's, it's certainly worth uh, preserving that paddock. And in fact, in some uh, situations, you might even be able to use those same paddocks as weaning paddocks, just depending on how things transpire. The final thought on worms is that because it is such a regional thing and a farm by farm thing, consult with your um, local specialist before you make any huge changes to your decisions. Okay, so let's move on now to hypercalcemia and um, pregnancy toxemia. These are the two most common causes of downer use. I mean, there are others. The obvious one is, is uh, in fact, just drought. They've got uh, no energy left. Um, they often overlap uh, and invariably um, hypercalcemia leads to pregnancy toxemia if left untreated. I'd say at this point also that pregnancy toxemia is extremely difficult to treat. So all of your efforts need to go into preventing it. And as everybody seems to have identified it as a big issue in their enterprises, or many people have, uh, then we'll spend some time talking about it. Okay, so pregtox is a really complex metabolic disease, but the end result is inadequate circulating blood glucose to maintain the use central nervous system functions. Here's what brings it on. It mostly occurs in old fat use with multiples. We can also have this sort of slightly not so fat U complex, and it's got a different physiology to the, the classic preg tox. We probably won't mention much more about the uh, slightly skinny sheep preg tox, except to say that it has a much better treatment outcome. The big killer with preg tox, in fact, is a difference between what they need to maintain uh, their um, blood glucose and what they can take in. So. Poor quality feed or an inadequate amount. For large areas of Australia, uh, particularly if you're early, uh, lambing in the early autumn, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, autumn and early winter, if there's not been a break, then uh, no matter how much tuck is around, it's probably going to be of inadequate quality. Um, the, the second issue, of course, is lameness, preventing feeding, and the classic one there is foot abscess. And foot abscess goes together not only with preg tox, but overweight use to start with. And thirdly, uh, prolonged yarding, handling, and transport. So classically, we see if the sheep are still up, they're unresponsive, they stare into space, the dummy syndrome, uh, you can walk up to them. And then depending on how bad they are within sort of anything from half a day to a couple of days, they go down. Uh, they're profoundly depressed and they frequently have their head on their flank, on their uh, flank, turned back on their flank. Um, people that have got a keen sense of smells like our Kiwi brethren, they tell us that you can actually smell the ketones on their breath. And a large number of these animals also have a wool break. In my experience, it is generally uncommon to have huge numbers go down in one sort of episode overnight. Uh, whatever the stressor is can certainly bring on, you know, reasonable numbers of cases, but generally they sort of progress through the mob until such time as whatever it is that's uh, uh, ticking it off um, is corrected. So this is a photo of uh, somewhere in Tasmania. Um, I'm not quite sure whether that sheep looks depressed or uh, in fact, it's just looking longingly at the uh, more than adequate tucker on the other side of the fence. Um, regardless, you might see in fact that it's uh, 
a classic preg toxin so far as she's sort of just sitting there really really sort of stoned out and she does have the wall break treatment is moderately successful if you get them before they go down so the oral propylene glycol solutions um, such as ketol and ceton um, glucose orally dextrose under the skin um, there is some information to show that the NASAIDs, so the drugs like Medicam that we are now going to be using for lamb marking, uh, may help these animals. Um, and you can help them also by inducing uh, lambing with drugs that you can get from your local vet. Um, the reality is that not many of them respond once they're down. So the best treatment for them is to play the Mozart's Requiem Mass. Um, as we have said before, you can have moderate success treating the sort of the not so fat use preg tox with propylene glycol, much better than the ones that are, are really big and fat and ugly. So this is a, a situation where prevention is absolutely critical. And um, the, the points that uh, I'd like to raise under this is, first of all, run those sheep a bit lighter. So if we can get them down in that sort of three or three and a bit range, the number of cases of preg tox that you're going to see uh, will absolutely go down very quickly. Now, if for whatever reason that's not possible, then really sometimes all they need to get a, uh, keep them going is um, a bit of a sugar fix. And the best way to provide them with that sugar fix is grain supplementation. If in fact they've mostly got good tucker in front of them, um, but you're starting to see cases, you might only need a trickle. Uh, and, you know, we usually start our clients on about 100 grams per head per day and maybe move it up to 150, fed two to three times a week. And we keep that up until they, they've dispersed on their, on their lambing paddocks. Um, patently, if you have uh, a situation where they're going down because there's a gross deficiency in the amount of energy they're taking in, then you need to up the grain supplementation to the point where it's actually providing an overall energy supplement rather than a rather than just a, a sugar lolly, if you like. Um, and there's plenty of people and computer programs that can help you with uh, feeding rates. It's absolutely uh, sensible that you have deft, quick and gentle handling at all pre lambing treatments. Now here in Tasmania, uh, we're beloved of pre lamb shearing. Uh, and then of course they stay around for another half day while they get drenched and foot bathed and then sort of uh, driven five kilometers back to their paddocks. It's not the way to go. Try and get them in and out of the shed quickly, whether they're being shorn or not. Um, you can sometimes load them up with a bit of grain before they, they go in uh, and certainly make sure that they've got access to good tucker plus or minus grain as they, as they come out. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and finally, get on top of your foot disease. If you've got foot rot, uh, you know, make sure that the, the prevalence is as low as possible. Just as importantly is, is in fact, uh, just as important as foot abscess. Uh, you know, inspect your flocks regularly, pull out those sheep, treat them with antibiotics, and also use one of the new NASA drugs that we've got. So we've got Medicam injection and buccal jesic orally. And if you can actually relieve the pain to the point where those sheep are sort of at least partly able to get around, it's quite surprising what a difference that makes to, to the overall uh, result. Okay, so hypercalcemia is the disease that I think uh, um, is confused with preg tox quite frequently. Um, and it's a little bit different that the end of the, or the, the critical event, in fact, is insufficient calcium to maintain normal muscular function in the, uh, in the animal. And we see it under these conditions when you have a change from uh, dry to lush pasture in late pregnancy, because dry pasture is, uh, is generally quite adequate with, uh, with calcium, lush green pasture, particularly straight irrigated grass pastures and worse still uh, winter cereals, particularly winter wheat. Um, we see it if they're held off uh, tucker for any length of time, so yarding, handling, transport. And you can also perhaps induce it with chronic high levels of grain feeding without a calcium supplement. So the sheep go down, 
they appear relatively bright and alert until they're in the terminal stages and a proportion of them uh, have a characteristic frog leg position so they're sitting up with their head in the air um, and uh, you know um, basically bright and alert but unable to get up and the thing about hypercalcemia is that it can affect you know sort of tens to hundreds in a mob in the last few years we've seen two maybe three major outbreak where without word of a lie there were 300 sheep down overnight and the easiest way in my experience to diagnose it is response to calcigol or flow pack so in fact you give them half a pack under the skin and lo and behold there most of them are up within about half an hour to 40 minutes in terms of preventing it again deft rapid handling of sheep don't kick them off off um, of tucker for too long. Now, this is important in our context because people are using irrigated circles more and more to run their uh, lambing ewes. Um, if they're on dry tucker in during the pregnancy, they should not receive calcium supplements unless they're getting grain. The other exception, in fact, is if they're on irrigated pastures, including winter cereals, for pretty much the whole pregnancy, then they probably should be uh, supplemented with calcium all during um, that pregnancy. But the, where we see problems, in fact, is when they're moved from dry tucker to green tucker, uh, and particularly sort of, I guess, intuitively, where they've actually been on calcium supplements on the dry tucker, and then they go onto the, onto the lush green tucker, and that's the one that's actually lacking in calcium. Um, all grain supplements, any more than sort of uh, the, the sugar lolly type fix, should be spiked with uh, a calcium source. And so our stock standard recommendation is 2% limestone or 4% um, dolomite. And of course, um, uh, oops, I'll go back if that's going to work. Um, when you, they move on to uh, lush sort of pastures, if they need calcium supplementation, then there's any number of different methods and we can maybe talk about that in questions if so needed okay so how are we going for time oh well, we better hurry up vaginal prolapse it's an increasingly problem a uh, big problem um, and here in tasmania we've seen cases that are consistent uh, flocks that are consistently reporting up to three percent occasional reports of up to ten percent of flocks uh, prolapsing and the mortality rate in those ones that do prolapse can be quite high. <coughs> now, our Kiwi brethren have done multiple, multiple surveys on this, um, and the things that come up consistently as causes are age and parity, so the number of lambs they're can carrying, um, the fact that they're being run on hills, and foot disease, and that's the approximate order of importance. Speculated things include tail length, um, we really should have our tail lengths the same as, as we do with our merinos, but it's not actually proven. Um, pasture type, so lush, high water content. Um, and the Kiwis have tried consistently to uh, solve the issue with calcium and magnesium supplementation. Um, there's also at least a modest amount of evidence that there might be breed differences. So um, clinical presentation, we'll show you a picture in a moment, but that's the uh, uh, sort of smooth, partially uh, everted uh, vagina sticking out the back of the U in the last month. Um, and we'll show you some pictures in two ticks. Treatment is pretty successful. Wash and replace it, hold it in place with sutures or retaining device, devices, and you may decide to induce lambing. Success rate's pretty good, provided you can get the lambs out. So that's the classic vaginal prolapse. You can see the sort of the, the little ring of the cervix up the sort of mid right there. Not to be confused with uterine prolapse, which obviously occurs after lambing, and apart from the fact that it's twice as big, uh, you've got the knobbly bits on it as well. Mostly, if you wash these down, squeeze them up with a, with a towel to get the blood out of them, push them back in, you don't need to suture them, away they go. And this is a fascinating syndrome that we're seeing more and more of, and that is where the intestines actually rupture out through the vagina in the last month of lambing. Um, 
we don't know much about it. Um, there's only been three or four papers written about it, so there's a PhD there for some uh, budding young person. But, you know, we see it. I hadn't seen it up until maybe six or seven years ago, but these, these days we see it every year. Okay, now prevention. Um, these are recommendations only because we don't really know what, what causes it. Again, keep your body condition a bit lower. I recommend that uh, crossbred ewes should have the same tail length as our merinos because if nothing else, it's going to help with the, uh, the fly control and it may just help with the prolapse as well. Treat your foot disease just the same as you would for preg tox. Well, calcium supplements as per discussed, but I'm not sure that it actually has uh, a great influence. Now, in the three minutes that we've got left, we'll talk very briefly about mastitis. Uh, again, this is a bit of a sleeper, but it is uh, um, a huge problem in some prime lamb flocks. I guess in Australia, particularly polled dorsets, um, we see an incidence of 2 to 20% in individual mobs. And of those cases, up to 60% of them die. The really important thing is that for each clinical case, there are three to five subclinical cases. And these guys are the ones that don't show overt signs, but their milk production is knocked to bilio, and as a result, they don't uh, lactate at all well. So here are the causes. We've got two major pathogens. Uh, don't worry so much about the names. Um, the information, uh, most of this information comes um, uh, from a colleague at Melbourne University, so thank you to Stuart for that. Um, Damage teats facilitate spread, and the two that we seem to see in Australia are grazing stubbles and scabby mouth. And it's probably spread from uh, you to you by all from the lambs stealing a drink. And that becomes particularly a problem when um, ewes are being fed along grain tails. There is a lot of information to show that there are genetic factors involved. Uh, and that sort of uh, affects everything from sort of teat shape to just inherent uh, predisposition. But we don't have enough handle on at the moment that we can act on it. <coughs> um, so here's a, a fairly mild case of uh, mastitis and sheep with just a lumpy udder. But uh, in other cases, as you would be well aware, you get uh, one side or the other actually goes black and a lot of those animals die. So the trick to trying to control this is identify the ewes early. So if you've got a history of it in your flock, keep a look out for the classic sort of wide-based, uh, uncomfortable sort of walk and give them oxytetracycline plus or minus a, an assayed injection uh, to try and not only get them up and going, but to stop the spread to other animals. We don't have any vaccines that may come in the future. There are vaccines available overseas, at least for the Mannheimia component. Uh, so the spread through the flock is really mostly done by preventing um, the early cases from giving it to everybody else. Yeah, we've got there, isolate the ewe and lamb. Of course, the trouble is, how do you find the lamb in that mob? So. Uh, you know, unless you're prepared to have that lamb as an orphan, then uh, you're probably best off leaving him in the paddock. Try and spread your grain trails out so that the lambs don't have as much chance to steal a drink. And it makes sense to do an annual cull of uh, sheep with lumps and misshapen udders. In the future, we may have genomics to identify the high risk sires. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're going to include it in an index, but uh, it might be a useful tool to identify those sires that are absolute dogs. OK, so in summary, keep your use lighter. It uh, has an impact on a whole host of different issues. Although I think on the central tablelands in New South Wales at the moment, keeping them light is not an issue. Um, Seek local advice on your current and pre uh, your current pre lamb worm control strategy, but don't be sort of totally blind to changing it. Um, the, you know, sometimes you can improve it there. Provide adequate feed to your twinners in late uh, pregnancy to prevent uh, preg tox. Supplement with grain if uh, if you need to, even if it's only a bit of a sugar treat. Avoid over supplementation with calcium in early pregnancy and uh, for both pregnancy toxemia and um, for uh, hypercalcemia, 
deft rapid handling through the yards is all important. Keep weight under control to reduce the risk of prolapse. So Jenny Craig, I think you're going to have a lot of new clients. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That was excellent. Uh, Paul's provided us with a few resources there on the final uh, final slide. Thank you for that, Paul. Uh, Paul, you had a uh, you had a, a very um, comprehensive or a full brief for this evening's webinar. So I uh, commend you on pulling together that amount of information and getting across to us all um, all in within the time frame. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, I'll give you a rest there for a couple of minutes. Now, uh, this is everyone's opportunity to start putting some questions in to Paul. And don't forget we have uh, Bruce Watt, uh, the Central Tablelands uh, Local Land Services um, vet or, or sheep health expert with us this evening as well. Uh, Bruce has uh, got a lot of experience in this space as well. And, and as Paul said at the beginning of the webinar, he was, he's going to be able to provide a alternative perspective on these particular new health challenges at and around the lambing period. So what we'll do is we'll let Paul uh, be the chair of the questions and, and if he feels that Bruce is better suited to a particular question then Paul can um, hand, pass it on and if Bruce if you want to make a comment then please just jump on in at any stage. Oh, you'll, be, you'll both have access to the mics when, when we start the question period. There's a few of you that no doubt will, will need to duck off uh, from the webinar this evening. Thanks for participating and, and supporting the webinar series. Now we have a few more webinars scheduled uh, for the remaining uh, this financial year. We haven't exactly nailed down the particulars yet, but we'll let you know as soon as we do, and so keep an eye on your emails and, and SMSs for any updates that may come online. Now, don't forget the post-webinar survey. We appreciate if you take a, just a quick moment to provide some detail there. Uh, the qualitative comments that people leave are most um, most uh, useful, and we share them with MLA and the presenters to help them um, do uh, you know improve their extension and and uh, and uh, get a better idea of what, what's relevant out in the marketplace at the moment. Uh, we obviously don't pass on contact details um, other than to, to MLA themselves. Now, um, Paul and Bruce, I'll just bring you back online there. Uh, Bruce, are you, are you with us now? Yes, David. Uh, good to hear you, Bruce. You're a little bit quiet, but that's okay. If you just speak into your computer, then, then I'm sure everyone will be able to hear yeah, will do. Um, Paul and Bruce, I might take the liberty and, and lead with a quick question. Um, just at the end there, Paul, you mentioned not to begin supplementation with calcium too early. Now, just to dig a bit deeper into that, is that because early supplementation begins to um, distort the metabolism of calcium or the natural processes of metabolizing calcium uh, that the ewe undertakes uh, because she has you know surplus uh, coming in and 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 is that what affects does that uh, damage their ability to metabolize calcium closer to the critical point of lambing that's that's pretty much it in a nutshell so you've got two things going on that the, the requirement for calcium unless the animals are chronically hypercalcemic for some other reason the requirement for calcium in sort of early to mid-pregnancy um, is not all that much above what is you know, required if they're walking around <coughs> smelling the roses. Um, so in fact, if you hyper supplement them um, in that stage, then in fact, uh, uh, their capacity to absorb dietary calcium goes down. Uh, and then when the, the load comes on in late pregnancy and particularly into lactation, uh, and as Bruce has pointed out, um, it can occur in lactation as well, and it's not just a pre lambing issue, um, then in fact, if you've uh, already uh, got their uh, parathyroid hormone wound right down, um, 
they struggle to cope. And of course, the, the other issue is that a lot of the time these animals are on pastures in the early part of pregnancy that are uh, generally fairly adequate with regard to calcium. Um, and then because everybody has done their lifetime new management type courses and they're keen to provide them with really good tucker, um, they move them onto the good tucker just uh, before they lamb. And of course, what happens is that those pastures are inadequate in, in, in calcium and so you get a double whammy. Bruce, would you like to add to that? I think you've covered it pretty well, Paul. I'd comment that um, there hasn't been enough research done on this in sheep. And to some extent, we're extrapolating from dairy cattle, where it's been established that if you feed them normal or high calcium uh, well up until calving, then the metabolic mechanisms for pulling calcium out of the, the gut, the kidneys and the bones uh, become lazy, if I could use that expression. Uh, they they require several weeks to get tuned up, and um, so we're extrapolating from um, from dairy cattle. But that it's it certainly fits with my experience. I've seen quite a bit of hypercalciemia in in sheep that have been well supplemented with calcium, and you wonder why. And and you and the conclusion I've come to is that simply the the mechanisms for pulling calcium out of the bones, gut, and, and kidneys are just not not tuned up like they should be. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Bruce. Um, just moving on to the questions from the audience now. Uh, Frank has provided us with a question here. Thanks, Frank. Um, how important? Uh, so this will be partially already answered, but there is a uh, another mineral here that's called in the question. How important is maintaining adequate reserves of of minerals in late pregnancy, especially the calcium magnesium balance. Uh, that's from Frank. Uh, Bruce, do you want to take first bite of that? Uh, magnesium is interesting. Um, it's really important in beef cattle in our area, and I think it's the major killer of, um, of, of cattle in southern Australia. I've never seen a case of grass tetany in, in sheep, and um, uh, I've quite a number of colleagues uh, that I've spoken to in New South Wales have not seen it. Uh, it's certainly been reported in Western Victoria, and uh, we know that grazing wheats are low in in uh, magnesium, and so we can uh, see problems with magnesium in in grazing wheat. But for me, magnesium is for sheep is nowhere near as important as calcium. A different story with cattle. Sure. Yeah, I'd, Sorry, Paul. I'd, I'd, look, I I'd concur with that 100%. I've never seen hyper, uh, hypermagnesemia. I think there are lots of theoretical arguments put forward as to why the uh, the balance between the two is important. But um, in in practical terms, um, it uh, lambs at pasture, um, I don't think that specifically targeting magnesium supplementation per se or the magnesium calcium balance is of great importance. Okay, thank you. Now, another question from Frank. Um, they're currently changing from British short wells to short wolves to hare breeds. Um, is, can you recommend any differences in pre-lambing management? Wow, um, not off the top of my head. Well, that's okay. But, uh, we, we don't we don't have many. Uh, we don't. Yeah, in fact, I've only got about one client that's got a hair breed, so called, uh, and he's not doing anything all that radically different, and seems to be doing all right. Okay. Ignorance is wonderful, Bruce. Yeah, well, let, I'll comment. I, I I can't answer that specifically either, but. I think the principles are very similar, uh, no matter what sheep you're dealing with. But I will agree completely with Paul's comment about the resilience of crossbreds. Uh, we were involved in uh, 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 funding. We were involved in trials looking at the impact of worms on, on crossbred use, and they really are uh, resilient, uh, both to uh, 
parasites and a whole heap of other conditions compared to merinos. So I guess um, uh, the hair breeds, uh, it depends. Uh, while the principles are the same, it depends where you put them on the spectrum between crossbreds and merinos, I, I'd suggest. And I think uh, in some ways, because they're a straight breed rather than a crossbreed, they may be less, probably less resilient than, than crossbreds. Okay. No, fair enough. Thank you. Um, good question, Frank. Thank you. Um, now, uh, Jennifer's asked a really good question here, and I think it's it'll provide a platform for either Paul or Bruce to have a word on the more um, systems-based uh, systems approach to, to lambing. But now the question is, uh, why do we have more problems with ewes lambing in June than we have with, with the ewes lambing at the end of August? Um, would you like to take the lead on that, Paul? Um, well, I don't know where the questioner lives um, and here in Tasmania we uh, tend to treat people that uh, lamb in June as bits of pariahs, it's just, just nobody, uh, nobody does it. So um, I'm struggling to answer that except from the point of view that um, in most areas, in the high rainfall areas in Australia, I would expect to have um, well, maybe not August, but by September, uh, much more pasture going forward. Um, outside of that, I'm not even sure that I'm qualified to say what other differences they might be. We just don't have autumn lambers here in Taz. Yeah, just quickly to fill you in, Jennifer's um, uh, there in the 12 inch rainfall country on the Eyre Peninsula of South Australia, uh, and they. Um, and they have trouble with grazing cereal stubbles over the summer. Um, the winter feed is mainly medic based, um, and they have milk feeder and preg tox. Uh, and you know, as as you suggested, that's a, mainly a problem with their fat use. So thanks, for that Jennifer. Um, at, uh, at I'm sure Bruce Bruce may be able to enlighten us because there are certainly uh, autumn lambers on the tablelands. Yeah, general, I think yeah, um, if you're if you're extrapolating from from your own experience, uh, that that to me is a bit risky because uh, you know that's a fairly limited survey. Uh, but I, I think in general, uh, autumn lammers are much more likely to suffer from preg tox than than use lambing a little bit later simply because of uh, pasture availability. So, uh, but, but I would be reluctant to, to generalise about uh, you mortal or you, you issues in uh, June versus a bit later uh, lambing. Um, I, I think it's very much a, it depends on the year, but, but I think in our area, and I'd, I'd really be reluctant to extrapolate from area to your area, but in our area, um, autumns are much less reliable than springs. So if we lamb in the autumn and winter, we're much more likely to have to feed than, than if we do in the spring. And so we've got, you know, all the issues associated with that. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Bruce. Um, now, a uh, question here from Ken. Ken has first cross use and they're going to lamb on, or begin lambing on the 20th of June. Um, Ken's currently drought feeding those ewes on hay and wheat um, in, in the interest of, of allowing their pastures to get ahead of them before the onset of winter. Um, Ken asks, how long before the lamb, uh, how long before they lamb should they be thinking about putting the ewes back onto the pastures? Um, they lamb on the 20th of June. Uh, look, my, my experience with, uh, with drought lots is, in fact, that in the worst case scenarios, you can even lamb down there. So, I mean, it's, it's ugly, particularly if the, if the feedlot gets dry, I'm sorry, gets wet, um, but it's not impossible and it's better than sending them back out to the paddocks um, and scattering lambs from uh, one end of the place to the other. Um, in broad terms, you know, we would say that uh, 
leave it as close as possible that is consistent with handling them for any pre-lamb treatments that they're going to get and to maximise the amount of pasture that's available. Um, so in fact, with their wheat supplement or their grain supplement, I think you said wheat, um, if they're getting uh, calcium on that, um, there shouldn't be any great issues um, on uh, uh, in terms of calcium uh, metabolism. And look, m my experience is that when you let sheep out of a drought lot or out of a, uh, you know, sort of a, a paddock drought feedlot with heavy grain feeding, um, their gut adapts much more quickly to uh, being back on pasture and really all you need to do is ramp down the grain feeding over two or three feeds. But to answer the question specifically, I'd be looking as close as two weeks before the start of lambing. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, a good question here from, good practical question from Ryan. Um, um, Ryan, uh, so David, could I just, do you mind if I just chip in on, on that question on um, uh, about uh, feeding ewes pre lambing. Please, please, please do. Yes, uh, it was it was Ken who asked the question, wasn't? It? Ken, Ken, one of the things that I that I'm chatting with people about in, in our area is that pre lambing ewes don't need fibre, uh, whereas in cold weather and post lambing to lack for lactation they do. So I, I suggest, unless people have got lots of hay, that they should really uh, be very careful with their hay supply and save it for uh, cold, miserable weather or lactation. Uh, if you've got plenty of hay, then that's fine and certainly makes grain feeding a little bit safer, but there's been quite a bit of research that shows you really can feed, uh, use pre-lambing on grain. So. I'll just um, leave you with that comment, and I certainly agree with uh, Paul's comments that um, about um, you know when to when to put them out on the pasture. Thanks, Dad Bruce. Um, so Ryan asks, uh, do you have any recommendations on the best way to spike your grain supplements with dolomite or, or calcium or lime? Oh wow, that's uh, that's a, a really good um, question. Uh, part of it depends on what sort of feeder you've got. If you've got sort of those uh, uh, triangular uh, feeders, um, or you know, sort of cone-shaped feeders, they tend to get a bit of a vortex in the middle. Um, there is at least some research to show that uh, uh, placing your calcium and magnesium, uh, or calcium depending on what it is, um, in that uh, is probably adequate, probably adequate. Uh, the mixing is not perfect, but it's not bad. Now, um, if you're running out grain trails from other feeders or bags or what, uh, something like that, you may need to look at, instead of just spiking the grain, uh, providing an additional calcium supplementation. And there's an absolute legion of those um, in the interests of of uh, economy, uh, I think that you can generally get pretty good calcium supplementation with something as simple as limestone and salt, 60-40 um, limestone to salt or even even uh, more limestone to salt. Uh, it's not very weather robust, uh, but I mean, if it's um, just depending on where you are, if, <coughs> if it's so wet that it's uh, causing you a great issue that that, that gets uh, gets gummed up all the time, you know, you can, uh, you, the chances are you probably don't need to be drought supplementing anyway. <coughs> um, so look, that's a brief answer. Um, Bruce uh, was, will, will almost certainly have some additional comments on that. Yeah, right. Look, I, look, I agree with Paul. I think there's really two two main ways of doing it. One is to try and mix it with the grain, uh, throwing, putting it up the auger has always worked well for me. Yeah. Uh, you, you can put it in the in the hopper and it mixes really well in the auger, uh, but you can uh, throw it in the top of the uh, the bin as well. And it, it, you know, by the time it fills us through, it's not too bad. And loose mixes work pretty well for us too. You know, the lime salt mixes um, uh, work pretty well as an alternative. But I, I really like uh, mixing it into the grain because you know you've got you know you've got to spread right through the through the grain. But it depends really a lot on um, 
on how, on how you how you're feeding, what you're feeding. I, I'm, I get a bit jumpy about putting too much lime in self feeders. I think they can block them up a bit, but um, some people disagree with me on that. Perfect. Thanks, Bruce. Um, Bruce and Paul, just to uh, help you guys gauge um, the questions you wish to address and, and, and to the extent you want to address them, uh, we, you, I'm noticing you're, you're getting a lot of interest on the uh, on the question uh, line here. We've done five questions and we've got about another 20 to go. So, um, and, they're, and they're still coming in. So um, I'll just uh, let that guide your, guide your answering technique. Um, <laughs> um, a, a good question here from Philip. Philip asks, I've, or he says, I've been increasingly been involved in using confinement feeding of pre-lambing ewes to allow pasture feed to achieve approximately 1,000 kilograms per hectare before introducing uh, the ewes. So that's uh, the traditional um, deferred grazing. Do you have a management plan to avoid stock health issues such as high cell calcemia or similar in this scenario? Uh, the question is, uh, are you seeing hypercalcemia in your confinement feeding? Um, in my experience, uh, you know, right up to and, in, you know, including uh, the let out phase, uh, if you're spiking the grain uh, with calcium, um, we don't uh, we don't see uh, much in the way of either preg tox or hypercalcemia, particularly given that uh, in confinement feeding, they're probably not going to be uh, um, living in Nirvana anyway. Um, and um, yeah, I the, the the biggest problem that I see with confinement feeding, in fact, is um, is uh, foot disease. So that can contribute to uh, to to preg tox. But yeah, I I just don't see those problems in in confinement feeding. Okay, thank you. Now there's a question here from Jody and Bruce. So I might direct this towards you. Um, have you seen any luck in preventing mass, mastitis uh, through using a double dose of six in one vaccination? No. Paul? No, nor would I expect to. Okay, so no, Jody, no double dosing with six in one as a prevention for mastitis. Uh, there's a question. Yeah, just stated on that, I can't, I can't see a rationale. The, the two bugs are, as Paul mentioned, Staphylococcus and Manheimia, a six in one doesn't cover any of those, so I can't, I can't see a rationale for it. Yeah. But uh, that's not saying six in one's not a great idea, but I can't see a rationale. Yeah. So there's no, yeah, the the, the active ingredient, the ingredients are completely different. So you could drench them uh, as much as you like, but it will have no effect. I couldn't say it has no effect. I just can say I can't see a rationale. Okay. Um, Wayne asked a question uh, for Wayne. Uh, I know Wayne. Uh, good to hear you online tonight, Wayne. He's up at um, up towards um, Millthorpe or, or or Bathurst Way. There, it's such a dry year, and there it's likely that they're going to be supplementary feeding the lambs through lambing. Um, should Wayne be considering supplements such as licks or blocks, lick blocks, or, or loose licks um, anywhere from a month out from lambing? Do you want to take that, Bruce? Your patch. Um, yeah, well, definitely depends depends on what's in the paddock, uh, Wayne, and um, and 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 the condition of the use. But if, if there's inadequate feed in the paddock, then I think definitely. Yeah, for sure. Um, Jenny Jenny asks, what are the recommendations for a feeding regime for ewes in a drought lot situation to avoid preg tox and hypo hypocalcemia? Uh, we may have addressed that already, Paul, but is there anything additional on the preg tox front you want to consider for, for feeding? Oh, look, uh, uh, the, the amount that they're being fed depends whether it's sort of an absolute drought lot or a little, you know, sort of a big paddock and a whole host of things like that. And it, it's a really complex answer. But, you know, in the last part of pregnancy, uh, with heavy crossbred, particularly twin bearing ewes, you're really going to have to stoke the grain into them. So we're talking, you know, four and a half to five kilos. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I've been rejected several times from running refugee camps, so I, I certainly don't uh, don't try to overdo them at all. Um, but just, you, 
probably need to take a bit of local advice from a nutritionist rather than me just sort of sprouting figures because uh, <coughs> um, uh, you can run into trouble depending on the size of your sheep and what's on the paddock. So don't underdo them at that stage, but don't send yourself broke hyper supplementing them with, with whatever their bulk feed is. Okay. The barber asks, uh, um, I can't help but I, have a, I had a little chuckle when I read it. Why do some people cut the tails of their sheep so short uh, they cannot wiggle them? Only one bone left. So, Barbara, I, I, I'm not sure why some people do that. Um, a good question here from Ross. Uh, you covered it briefly, Paul, but where can we or who can advise us better on managing youth with prolapse and the appropriate management technique? Um, any particular resource you have in mind or, or and Bruce as well? Look, if, uh, if, if we can find it, I'd like to read it as well, David. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, look, sorry, I'll, I'll, since, since I've made that somewhat flippant remark, I'll, I'll, I'll better uh, continue. Uh, I agree with Paul's comments that the main factors in, in prolapse in use are, are fat use or use that are greater than, you know, that's called four, and and uh, at least our New Zealand cousins tell us hilly country, um, and and that's probably accounts for seventy or eighty percent of the vaginal prolapse we see in the central tablelands. But we do see vaginal prolapse in odd situations occasionally that don't fit that picture at all. Uh, and I was mentioning to Paul, you know, uh, maiden merino used in that's called one and a half uh, with prolapses. I can explain that. So. It, do, it doesn't, um, I think the critical thing that you can manage, which was one of Paul's key points, is uh, you don't want to have you use underfed, but you don't want to have them over fat either. Over fat leads to a whole heap of problems from pre-tox to vaginal prolapse to uh, uh, casting so, uh, and dystopia. So, so I certainly agree that that's a key point. Yeah. Uh, D David, I just add very briefly to that, that that one thing we haven't mentioned with vaginal prolapse is the possibility of uh, estrogenic clovers, which we hope might have been er eradicated. But if you're in the uh, uh, the Mediterranean zone and you've got the old style um, uh, Western Australian type uh, clovers, then that that can be a contributing factor. But outside of that, the surveys that have been done in New Zealand only give us the vaguest sort of ideas of what the causes are and their pet theories, uh, which are, uh, well, in case particularly calcium, magnesium, nutrition, um, that don't seem to add up at all. So it's something we just don't know much about. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, thanks, Paul. Now, there's two questions here that are quite close together and quite similar. Mark and Brad, um, I'm going to do both these questions, Paul and Bruce, uh, because I think they'll have a similar, maybe a similar answer. Mark says, I've got used lambing on, uh, oh, grazing native pastures on acid soils. Uh, Mark wants to know if you think adding calcium to the diet is very important and should it be done earlier than late in pregnancy? Now, Brad, he's, um, he's feeding crossbred ewes one kilogram of maize a day they're in day 50 of pregnancy and he was wondering whether he, uh, a 2% lime in the ration is or is it too early for the ewes because they're at day 50 of pregnancy. So I think, um, I don't know if there's a, a, a different answer to those two questions but it's, it's commenting on the, you know, should the calcium be provided early or late in the pregnancy. I'll, I'll lead off and then uh, ask Bruce's comments, even if the questions are building up. It's a, it's a good one. M my experience with uh, with native pastures um, is that uh, they're really deficient in calcium. Um, so unless they are also receiving supplementation, um, then uh, I'd not be as concerned about it as if they were on green winter cereals. Um, the second part, the gentleman who's feeding the maize, I think he said. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's anything special about maize. Uh, you know, it's a it's a, <coughs> a potent sort of grain, uh, deficient in calcium and relatively high in phosphorus. Same thing. Just stick to the that sort of uh, two to th two to four percent 
calcium uh, as limestone or, or dolomite uh, as an additive, but uh, and basically all the time that they're on on that sort of grain supplement. Bruce, thank you, Paul. I um, get nervous about uh, calcium in the first half of pregnancy. I'm 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 conscious that grains, including maize, are low in calcium. So that so that recommendation does make me nervous. Uh, but I don't see hypocalcemia in the first half of pregnancy. And I know in some districts they see bone fragility, and you and I have talked about this before. Um, uh, in use, if they, if you're seeing bone fragility, that suggests their calcium reserves in their bones are inadequate. But and if you're in that kind of area, then you definitely need to supplement calcium. In my area, I don't see issues with calcium in the first half of pregnancy, and I don't see bone fragility. So I'd rather not supplement calcium in the first half of pregnancy. But as I, as I said before, this is not backed by well by research. That's essentially my feeling on what seems to work in our area. Okay, that's good, Bruce. Thank you. That's very interesting. Now. Um, there's a question here from uh, uh, Stefan. Um, is feeding oat and hay in containment areas going to create problems with the calcium levels? Uh, the sheep went in immediately after the fifth week. So is oat and hay deficient in calcium? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Now that it's probably it's probably deficient in energy as well. Yeah. No. Good point. Now that makes me. Um, I might take the liberty of asking: Is there a nutri? You know, when you when we have our, our standard uh, feed analyses conducted, is there any indication on a on a, on a on a feed analyses as to the calcium deficiency of a particular feed stuff, or do we have to get a a more specialised test done to understand whether a particular feed stuff is, is going to lead to these calcium deficiencies. Uh, really good um, question. Sorry, you go, Bruce. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, David. Look, I've I've been getting some feed analyses done recently, and I don't think uh, calcium is routine in those. And I could, look, I could be wrong. We we tend to go on rules of thumb on that. And, and there's been a lot of testing done of cereal grains, and we know that they are very low in calcium, almost invariably, and cereal hays are, are the same. So I think operating on, on a rule of thumb, cereal, cereal hay and, and grains are, are low in calcium, whereas any hay containing uh, legumes is gonna be high in calcium. Uh, but I'd have to say that um, I tend to operate on rules of thumb rather than rather than testing, and, and that's probably a risky strategy. We should be doing some more testing on that. Yeah, good point, Bruce, thank you. A uh, question here from Robert. Um, thanks, Robert, for sending your question. What do you think about the theory calcium source from lime is not great because that forms, uh, the, the form alkalizes the blood, which stops the natural processes that metabolize the calcium from the bones. Is there any other source of calcium? Can you use gypsum? Um, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, all I can say is that where we see uh, hypercalcemia um, induced either by very high grain feeding uh, and or, you know, pasture feeding for that matter, that uh, pragmatically uh, the use of, of limestone as a uh, source of calcium seems to solve the issue. Okay. Bruce? Uh, yeah, David, this, this touches on the whole issue of, of the cation anion balance, which is, uh, and certainly uh, a slightly more acid blood does result in, in better uh, calcium absorption. But the cations and anions are largely determined by uh, what's in the forage rather than, than the lime itself. And so I, I'd agree with Paul that, um, you know, s supplementing calcium deals with the problem so i'm while i can see that there might be i can i can i can i can see that argument it, it, it doesn't i don't see that as a a, a practical problem 
Okay, no worries. Now, I might pick on you again, Bruce. Uh, there's a question here. Um, now, um, thank you, James. James, uh, is there any difference to, or how do we um, diagnose ewes that are suffering either from pregtox or hypocalcemia? Is there any difference in the way they present uh, in the paddock, Bruce? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Paul, Paul covered this, but I'll, but I'll summarise it uh, again too. Um, as Paul mentioned, use with pregtox uh, in the early stages of the disease, they stand around separate from the mob. Uh, they look dull. They tend to look towards the sky. They, and if you drive up to them, they act like they're a little bit confused or they can act like they're blind. But, but they are, they, they are standing. Uh, Ewes with hypocalcemia, again, in the early stages, uh, I describe them as being like a sheep bogged in the dam. They're bright and alert, they just can't get up. So uh, they pay attention to you, they look at you, uh, and they sort of shuffle and try to get up, but they can't. But once both of those diseases have been progressing for a few days, they kind of merge into one another and the sheep becomes dull and sick and has its head round to one side, and you and they're, they're much harder to tell apart. But really, in the early stages, they're they're, they're really quite distinct. Uh, and if I'm called on to diagnose whether it's pregtox or hypocalcemia, I really like to look at early cases, and I can usually tell clinically. But blood tests are also very instructive, and and uh, used with hypocalcemia have profoundly low blood calcium levels, and used with pregtox have elevated beta hydroxybutyrate levels and normally normal or slightly low calcium levels. So yes, quite easy to diagnose the difference. Yeah, great. Thanks, Bruce, that's perfect. Um, now, Melanie has a, a fairly involved question here, so just keep a track on this, guys. Um, uh, she still wants to discuss the calcium supplementation. Um, so uh, starting from before day 80, of pregnancy to lambing and now at 35 days uh, post lambing, Melanie's been supplementing hev uh, fe heavily supplement feeding and also supplementing with calcium. Uh, she gives their calcium as lime in a pot near their dam and tends to let and she lets the sheep uh, tell her when when they don't want any more because they've stopped because they stop eating it. Um, and, and when they don't need them anymore, uh, she should see Melanie suggests her soils are calcium deficient, and she asks, "Could I be harming their health by supplementing them in this way? And should I change the sheep leave their grain um, for their lime and salt mix uh, of two to one, uh, two parts lime, one part salt, or less uh, when she puts it out? Any comment there, Paul? I don't think she's going to be." Um, harming them, well, you know, while ever they're on uh, uh, heavy supplementary feeding, then I'd still be providing them with grain. Uh, sorry, <laughs> stupid boy, still be providing them with uh, with uh, calcium um, supplementation uh, because you know even if <clears throat> with calcium supplementation on <clears throat> grain feeding, we're trying to do more than just pre prevent clinical hypercalcemia. Um, so we know, in fact, that that um, the animals that have been sort of drought-lotted for long periods of time uh, may fall over the edge into this bone fragility syndrome. So as a rule of thumb, uh, uh, certainly uh, like Bruce's comment on it, um, I'd uh, not uh, be stopping calcium supplementation while ever they're on um, a fairly heavy drain ration. Um, <laughs> the additional comment is that I've never been super convinced of the notion that because they go away from something, they don't they don't actually need it. I think that uh, <coughs> um, sheep's capacity to select what they need is sometimes uh, used by people marketing all sorts of wonderful potions. Um, so yeah, that's that's a bit of an aside. But Bruce, what would you think? Yeah, Paul, um, that whole if I could touch on the subject of uh, sheep or cattle or, or other animals selecting what they need, that, that's known as nutritional wisdom. And there's been uh, quite a bit of work done on that. And I often get asked questions about that. 
my feeling is that livestock in general are only uh, are only perceived deficiency in a couple of things. And one of them is phosphorus, and we know that cattle will chew bones when they're phosphorus deficient, and the other is sodium, and whether it's cattle, sheep or us, we certainly seek sodium. But uh, there's been research done that uh, shows that you can have selenium or cobalt deficient sheep or cattle or, or rabbits and offer them supplements with or without those minerals and they and they don't pick it. They can't pick it. So I don't, like Paul, I, I'm, I think that nutritional wisdom is pretty limited um, and I'm, I'm not swayed too much too much by it. Just, just uh, back on the on the subject of um, whether you should or shouldn't be feeding calcium in late pregnancy, uh, I'll stick with my comment that I, under normal circumstances that we see in the central tablelands, I get jumpy about calcium in the first half of pregnancy. But once you're in the second half, whether you did or didn't in the first half, you've got it. You should supplement calcium in the second half if you're on a calcium deficient ration. Once you once you're underway, you won't get out of trouble by stopping calcium. The 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 body, the me, the the metabolic uh, systems of the body to pull calcium out of bones, uh, kidney and intestine, they mightn't have been turned on very well because you've been feeding calcium in the first half of pregnancy. But the only way to overcome that is to keep feeding calcium. You can't you can't stop uh, at in late pregnancy or early lactation or you will get hypercalcemia. Yeah, good advice. Thanks, Bruce. Um, very good, very good. Now, uh, Mark, uh, your question, I can't quite understand your question, Mark. Um, Mark, uh, just have a look at that there. Something about different, something about feeding uh, ewes. Might just type it in again. I think there's a, a spelling error there that I can't make out. Um, uh, question here from Matthew. Thanks, Matthew. I think Matthew's over in South Australia. Good to see you online tonight. Um, instead of spiking the grain, is it better to provide um, cerumen or Pat Colby mix? Uh, are you familiar with that, Paul? No, not at all. It's, I thought Pat Colby was a horseman. <laughs> um, Bruce? I think so. Uh, look, I'll let that one go through the keeper, David. Um, I mean, uh, no, I, I think they're um, proprietary mixes. Uh, Pat Colby's recommendations have been around for a long time. I don't uh, understand them fully, and uh, I w it would be not it wouldn't be appropriate for me to to offer a comment. Yeah, Matt. Matt just uh, made us aware that this it might be Syro Min. Um, it's a CSIRO mix, so not for, uh, still doesn't ring any bells, Paul or, or Bruce. No, the, the general comment would be, uh, David, that we, we sometimes tend to radically complicate what's a very simple problem. Um, now, um, you know, if if you've got trace element deficiencies, then mostly the solution, in fact, is to supplement the animal directly. Um, in the case of the macro elements, uh, depending on exactly which one we're talking about, um, then, you know, again, direct supplementation. Uh, there's been books, some of them reputable, a lot of them utterly disreputable, you know, written about balance theory and uh, how this affects this and that affects that. Look, keep in mind that sheep that are getting most of their nutrition from pasture um, their, their supplementation requirements in terms of either micro or macro elements can generally be dealt with fairly simply. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Paul. Um, Paul and... uh, David, could I just, just add, look, I agree completely with Paul. Uh, the main deficiency you're really going to be facing um, at the back end of, you know, uh, late pregnancy and lactation is calcium, as we've talked about. Other than the big obvious ones like energy and protein, uh, I, I will I will mention that um, if it's been dry for six months or longer, as it has in uh, northwestern New South Wales, uh, then vitamin A and vitamin E will become deficient and may already be becoming deficient. We're certainly not that in not in that condition. 
are not in that shape in the central tablelands. We've had green pick and occasional rain, um, you know, over the last few months. But if if you're in a situation where you haven't seen rain for six months, then uh, you need to consider vitamin A and vitamin E as well. But that but that's unusual. Uh, but it, it's certainly a risk for those of those of us unfortunate enough to have not seen rain for a long period of time. So, but in general, in general, I, I'm not in favour of shotgun mixes either. Like Paul, I'd rather say, what are we deficient in? What's the most efficient way of supplementing that? So, Bruce, how would we test for vitamin A and vitamin E deficiency? Um, well, you can do blood tests for both of those. My feeling is that uh, you can speak to your veterinary advisor about that and, and ask to, for blood tests. But, but, in, in, but, it, but if you don't do that, I, I would think if you've been for six months without any green feed at all, then you should be... It's not very expensive. I'd probably go ahead and do it. Okay, interesting. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Bruce. Now, a uh, very practical question here from David. Thank you, David. Um, um, they're, they're, pre they're feeding pre-lambing ewes on a full barley ration. Uh, he, David wants to know if in a feedlot situation, in a drought lot situation, can they be fed daily or should they be fed daily or can you get away with three feeds a week in the, in the drought lot? Paul? Uh, once they enter the last... Um Oh, say the last six weeks of pregnancy, I'm happier that they be fed daily. Now, in saying that, I know that there are people who, uh, you know, and there is some research work to show that they can still get by with three feeds a week. Uh, but for a whole host of reasons, um, I just get pretty uncomfortable with it. And we have seen some problems with it. And, uh, you know, Given the scrutiny that uh, those sort of operations are under from all sorts of people, from you know, sort of passing busybodies to uh, dr drones flying overhead, um, I generally recommend the uh, the daily feeding for the last six weeks until they go out of the feedlot. Okay. But I'd love to hear what Bruce has to say. Uh, yeah, I. I um... I haven't had any bad experiences with feeding three times a week, so so my my experiences are a bit biased, Paul. If you've had bad experiences, I think that that needs to be underlined. So for me, I'm I'm okay with 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 uh, three times a week, but I haven't uh, we I haven't come adrift with that, um, and uh, yeah. Uh, most of the work that I, uh, this is not really answering the question, most of the work that's been done on maintenance feeding of sheep indicates that you can, in fact, uh, the lot of the work done uh, after the 1944 drought indicated you could actually feed, believe it or not, feed sheep once a week. But that uh, pregnant and late pregnant use is a totally different story to that. Um, and yeah, I, um, from my experience, yes, three three times a week is okay. But I'd certainly take notice of, of Paul if he's had uh, uh, some unpleasant experiences with that. What what we tend to do, Bruce, is uh, sort of uh, it, when they're at the maintenance stage of pregnancy, which is you know pretty much the first third, then two or three times a week, depending on your staffing situation. Uh, if it is two yeah. times a week, we move them to three times a week, and then um, yeah, as I said, most mostly in the last five weeks daily, but... Uh, Fair enough. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Now, um, good question here from Ross. Um, it does good green loosen hay supplemented with grain, um, is that adequate to cover calcium needs, the inclusion of the, of the, of the green loosen hay in the diet? Maybe, maybe Bruce? Uh, well, it depends how much loosened hay. I mean, if it was only five percent, probably not. But if it was twenty percent, uh, twenty or thirty percent, then I, I think yes. Uh, just off the top of my head, I think that would be adequate. Okay. Uh, but but I would again, I would again, 
uh, repeat my comment that depends on uh, that hay should be really, if you're in a drought, hay, uh, you don't need to feed hay uh, pre-lambing, but it's really valuable post-lambing. So, so just bear that in mind. I mean, loose and hay and grain is a terrific ration, really well balanced, very safe, but uh, it's a matter of shepherding your resources. And so if you've got plenty of loose and hay, that's great. If you're really short of it uh, and you had a, if I was really short of loose and hay, I'd, I'd be saving it for wet weather and for, for lactation and, and getting by with, mm. with grain as much as possible pre-lambing. Yeah, great. Thanks, Bruce. Now, yeah. uh, an involved question from James. Uh, this is related to worms. Um, James is, they have a new, newly sown pasture that has virtually no worms. Um, uh, if your sheep have moderate worm burden need a drench, would you drench the sheep and return them to their original paddock to pick up a few worms before putting them out on the clean paddock to help drench resistance or should you drench them and put them straight out onto the clean paddock? Good question there for Paul. Uh, it is indeed. Um, I'd preface the comment by, by saying that um, uh, we get lots and lots of queries about sort of sheep emptying out in the yards or the sheds before they go back to a, a, a paddock so that the paddocks aren't contaminated. Look, I think in reality, the um, resistance status is going to reflect that of across the whole place rather than that one paddock. So um, in terms uh, of preventing resistance, um, you know, in theory, you could you could um, uh, you know leave a proportion undrenched or alternatively yeah, let them pick up a few worms but in practice i don't think it matters because in fact when they move off that paddock onto the next paddock um, then the worms on that paddock will reflect the <coughs> reflect that of the whole farm so if it's expedient to put them straight out on the paddock do so with great confidence okay thanks for that any comment bruce or uh, okay uh, yeah, look, I, yeah, I agree with Paul on that, that a single paddock shouldn't make much difference. I guess I'd, I'd make the comment that I'm not sure where the questioner is, but the whole matter of refugia management depends a lot on where you are. And if you're out, out west, uh, then um, as I was out in western New South Wales and, and, and some of our good researchers in, in WA, uh, you've got to manage refugia much more carefully and avoid drenching either, say, summer stubbles uh, out west or in WA, but in, in, um, in the central tablelands where worms survive a lot longer on pastures, or I'd suggest in Tasmania that refugia management is, is less important than, uh, than it is uh, in, different, in different places. Is there any advantage of using calcium magnesium supplements in an organic form as opposed to using them in the organic forms of lime and cosmag? Paul? Um, the nutritional um, the nutritionists tell us that uh, organic calcium uh, have, have some advantages. Uh, I think the summary position is that for the situations that we're talking about um, tonight, it doesn't matter a hoot at all. I mean, you know, pragmatic solution is no, it doesn't make a difference. <coughs> um, and, um, you know, really you're after cost efficiency, ease of uh, administration and, um, uh, you know, sustainability. Thanks for that, Paul. Um... Um, a question from Robbie. Robbie uh, asks, is dolomite sufficient as a source of lime? Uh, Paul, you covered that. Did you say that dolomite at 4% is equivalent to lime? Yeah, just uh, roughly speaking, that's, that's, uh, that's the ratio. And in fact, again, in pragmatic terms, you get enough calcium from that. Okay, thank you. Well, this was, which, pragmatically, we seem to. Um, Robbie also asks, is calcium, is calcium supplementation going to change the pH of the sheep's stomach and affect its ability to lamb by itself? Any comment there, uh, Paul or Bruce? 
Uh, um, I'm happy. I'm happy to comment. No, yeah. no, no, I think uh, no. The the amount of calcium you're adding to the rumen is uh, calcium is is alkaline. It, it is sometimes fed as a buffer, but really the the quantity you're feeding is is uh, I, I think unlikely to change the pH. Um, yeah. There's just not enough, not enough of it. Yeah, for sure. Now, Mark, who asked, uh, who I couldn't quite. Um, interpret his question before he's re-asked it. Thanks for that, Mark. Mark's been recommended a lead-up lick, uh, which is common in the dairy industry, and it's been recommended that he, he uses a lead-up lick ad lib uh, two weeks before lambing to help use mobilise calcium. Do you think this is worthwhile, uh, Paul? Um, look, the answer is I don't know. Uh, because of the... Um extraordinary requirements in the transition from sort of late pregnancy to lactation in in um, uh, dairy cattle then you know, transitional dieting or transitional dietary considerations are absolutely critical my um, experience is that um, lots of stuff is extrapolated from dairy cattle to sheep to the marketer's advantage with little or no information to back up that it actually pays any dividends. And again, pragmatically, uh, we see that, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, simple supplementation rather than um, <coughs> multiple steps or anything like that seems to do the job. But um, if somebody has uh, experience or information to the contrary, I'd really love to hear from them. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Question here from James. Uh, for use in late pregnancy and lactation on green pasture alone, would you recommend putting a calcium magnesium lick block out or would a pasture hay suffice or su would pasture hay supplement suffice for the calcium requirements from James? Uh, Bruce. I, I think it, it depends on the pasture. Um, and, and depends where where you are. I, I don't. Um, if the pasture's got any legume at all in it, then I don't think um, uh, he would need uh, calcium. But if it's a, a very grass-based pasture, and particularly with or, or, or you know with or cereal-based uh, crop, then yes, yes, I think he would need calcium. Having said that, I mean uh, hypercalcemia in. In our situation on central tablelands, uh, on normal mixed legume grass pastures, is, is really quite rare. People people will bring it on, particularly by and uh, Paul mentioned this, particularly by bringing sheep in for uh, shearing or crushing free lambing and holding them off feed, uh, and that that'll certainly induce hypocalcemia. Hyper but we, we don't see it. We see it pretty rarely under normal situations on normal pastures. Unfortunately, we don't have normal pastures at the moment. Uh, you know, we're feeding supplements, which some of which are very low in calcium, as, as we've mentioned. I'm interested, gents, that for a disease or a health challenge that is uh, ranked as the second lowest in interest or importance, that it's 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 hijacked our question time considerably this evening. So, uh, very interesting, very interesting that. Um, now, yeah. David, if I just may very briefly uh, add to what Bruce said there, uh, you know, we, uh, we we don't see hypercalcemia on perennial mixed grass clover either. Uh, but our situation is that uh, because of our cropping rotations, um, there's two things happening. One is that ewes are living on sort of green grass only pastures pretty much year round and that can induce sort of long term calcial, calcium marginality uh, but uh, increasingly also they're either uh, lambing down on pivots of grass and or pivots of winter cereals particularly winter wheat which is really flavour of the month and they're the ones that are dynamite uh, for you know, hypercalcemia particularly if they've just been moved off a, off a dry um, sort of more native type pasture so 
you know, in, in broad terms, unless there was something else to indicate a problem, I probably wouldn't be recommending any calcium supplementation on a mixed perennial green rye grass clover type pasture. <coughs> yeah, and, I, and nor would I, but I agree completely about grazing cereals. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we're getting to the end of the questions, and I, I'm, I suspect um, a few of the audience will be starting to, to, to look to head off, and we've maintained 60 people this evening, so um, that's a really good number of people to stick around for question time, and a, a credit to both Paul and Bruce. Now, um, a quick question from Ryan. Uh, any thoughts on the use of bentonite in feed mixes, uh, Paul? Um, uh, there's, there's two uses for it. One is as a as a buffer, um, and it's moderately successful at that. <coughs> <coughs> Depending on which stage you're in, if you're in a drought lot feeding situation, you may need a buffer, and it's one of the options. But there's generally speaking, I think better ones available. Um, then there's sort of all the other uses which sort of fall into the dark arts, and generally speaking. I'm not convinced that it, it uh, plays a great role. Um, so that's that's the brief answer to that. Okay, thanks, Paul. Any further comment, Bruce? Uh, no, look, I, I I agree with Paul's comment. I I also think it's not a particularly good buffer, uh, and I I no, I'm not a not a huge fan of uh, feeding bentonite. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, just to finish off here, we we actually are at the end of the questions as they've been put to me this evening. Uh, Ross has provided us with a quick comment. He's had a um, a bad autumn with spontaneous vaginal rupture, um, and half of the you uh, deaths, not half the years, but half the year deaths have died as a result of spontaneous vaginal rupture. Um, they were mostly twinners, although he did notice a few singles as well. So it sounds like a, uh, an acute, um, something something acute has caused that on Ross. But any comment there, Paul or Bruce? Uh, what, um, I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to know what Ross's uh, breed of sheep and the pasture type he was on. Hmm. Uh, he could maybe send that through to you or, or yeah. somehow get in contact with it's me. A, it is a, it's an autumn lambing flock. But, Ross, if you have any comment on, oh, you got some uh, detail on what type of sheep and, and what pasture they were lambing onto, that would be, yes, here it is. Uh, they are first cross ewes. And, um, yeah, first cross ewes and, um, and they were on a loosened pasture. Did they have a lot of... Pasture Ross, or was it a um, was it a pretty pretty low? Uh, if you're anywhere within a couple hundred kilometres of, of me, I'd say it'd be fairly low. But um, maybe it was uh, irrigated. No, Bruce, uh, Ross says it was adequate loose and pasture. So yeah. Yeah, David, could I comment on that if you don't mind? Um, Ross, uh, look, spontaneous vaginal rupture is is a, a strange condition. And uh, uh, it's for, on, in some cases producers uh, can lose uh, quite a few sheep. It, it's 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 very much associated with um, big ewes in uh, generally good condition that have generally got at least twins. Um, so I guess it's a it's a disease of if, if there's any consolation, it's a disease of good management. If you're doing things pretty well, you've got big sheep that, are, that have got twins and they're in pretty good order, uh, then you can get, you can see this problem. I, uh, because it seems so sp sporadic uh, from one year to the next, I, I would be reluctant to suggest to you that you should, you know, reduce the size of your sheep the feeding of the sheep to get twins because you know, what you're doing otherwise is um, associated with high productivity. So um, uh, uh, hopefully you don't see it year in, year out. In my experience, people don't, but but it's it's not to be underestimated. People can certainly lose quite a few sheep in, in any one year from the problem. Yeah, 
Thanks, Bruce. Um, any further comment, Paul? Oh, look, just that, that what Bruce said, we mostly see it in large sheep. So I guess our first cross ewes are not particularly uh, not particularly big here in Taz, but uh, you know we, we see that in, in some of the sort of uh, 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 Coopworth and Romney derivatives, um, increasingly popular are the compies. They're all prone to it, big fat, big animals and big fat animals. So we can reduce the fatness, but uh, we probably should be a bit careful about reducing the frame size. Great, right here. Well, that, um, that pulls our questions up for this evening. Um, it's uh, 9.40, so that almost, that probably takes a cake as our longest question and answer period. Uh, Paul and Bruce, uh, and uh, testament to how many questions we received. So well done this evening. Thanks for participating. Now, um, that's the uh, webinar for this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for attending. Um, don't forget to complete the post-webinar survey. It'll pop up as soon as this webinar ends. And we value the information. Don't forget to keep an ear out and for and an eye out for texts and emails of upcoming webinars and topics, which uh, I'll be filling you in on as the uh, detail um, uh, comes comes online. So thanks to MLA for making these a possibility, and thanks very much to Paul and Bruce for a, for a great evening and, and for being part of it. So I appreciate your time and uh, bid you a good evening, Paul and Bruce. Thanks, David. Good night, Bruce. Bye-bye.